Well, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Jim Brosnan. This is the June edition of uh, Tennessee Turf Tuesday. Uh, thanks again for joining us. This has been a uh, fun series for our group here at UT to, to put on and, and kind of allow us to share uh, relevant turf grass information with you and, and deliver some pesticide credits while you're still you know, at your jobs and offices, maybe you're having lunch right now and you can you can connect with us here for the next hour and earn a pesticide credit. Um, before we jump into today's topic and, and speakers and whatnot, I wanna just kind of go through some of the particulars about the pesticide credits uh, related to these sessions because I know that that's important and it's a big driver for why many of you are with us today. Um, you all registered for today's session and in the process of registering, you answered questions. Uh, those questions captured all of the data that we need for uh, pesticide uh, uh, credit registration. So you were asked what state you're in, what state you'd like credits in, uh, what your license number is, et cetera. All of that will be used to generate a roster and those rosters will be sent to the states that have awarded this session pesticide credit. And I believe we have uh, upwards of 12 states in total uh, that we can offer credits in. If you are uh, with us from the state of New Jersey, you have one extra step to go through to get your pesticide credit. Uh, we will need you to send a photo of your ID and that photo has to be time stamped uh, to me, and I can put my email address in the chat uh, once we get started here. We need a photo of your ID time stamped for New Jersey at the beginning, and we need a photo of your ID time stamped at the end. And those are the, the steps needed for New Jersey pesticide recertification only. If you are interested in other states, particularly Tennessee, all of that, that information was captured at registration and will go to the Department of Agriculture in a, in a fairly uh, seamless process. I should also note the sessions being recorded. Uh, we place the recorded uh, Tennessee Turf Tuesdays uh, on our YouTube channel you, uh, at UT Turfgrass on YouTube. Uh, if you are watching this as a recording on YouTube, there are no pesticide credits for archived views. Uh, you can only get your pesticide credits for live viewing, and we need you to stay with us for the duration of the hour. Uh, in order to get that pesticide credit. And, and Zoom, is, Zoom is watching, right? So Zoom tracked the moment you came into our webinar today and they will track the moment that you leave. So um, please stay with us for the hour in order to get the credit that you are interested in. And then the last thing, uh, just in terms of mechanics and nuts and bolts, is about asking questions. Um, today's topic of brown patch and tall fescue. Uh, we, we had our first Tennessee Turf Tuesday in April. We talked about tall fescue lawns and brown patch was a major um, area where we got a lot of questions. And to field those questions effectively, um, what we need you to do is use the Q&A box. So on the bottom right hand side of your screen, there's a Q&A box ask your question there and we will try to address all of those questions on air uh, aloud and if for some reason we can't get to all of them uh, we will uh, respond via text in that q a box and that's really helpful because the question and the answers will stay threaded together so if you have a question today uh, as we go through this discussion about brown patch and tall fescue uh, use that q a box to uh, move your question forward. Now that we're through all the particulars, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Brandon Horvath, our uh, turfgrass pathologist here, and David Shell, his technician, along with Dr. John Sorokin. I would say that John, you and I are brown patch enthusiasts, and these, these two gentlemen are brown patch professionals. So we're, uh, we're into June, fellas. What, what do we need to know about brown patch? Well, it's... Uh... You know, we, we've had uh, an interesting spring for sure. Uh, it's been somewhat cooler uh, and, and, uh, and, and cooler than average. So uh, June is shaping up to be okay, assuming that we don't get just ridiculously hot. But uh, uh, most years we're starting to ramp up 
the the optimal time for brown patch uh, here in the beginning of June, and um, you know we're we're starting to enter that period where we can expect uh, hot and humid temperatures. You got right here over my shoulder is the uh, map of the United States, and that lighter green section there is that transition zone area that we're in, where Dr. Sorokin likes to say, uh, courtesy of Dr. Powell at uh, University of Kentucky that uh, we grow all the grasses equally poorly. And uh, when it comes to the grasses that are susceptible to brown patch, that's uh, absolutely true. This is that period of time where they're gonna start being kind of at their weaker uh, you know, capability of defending themselves. So you know, knowing that there's a lot of lawn care folks that are listening right now with us, you know, is there a sort of trigger temperature? Like, I mean, I hear people talk about the lawn care industry, like once the, once the nighttime temperature is over 70, that's when you need to be on the lookout for, for brown patch and a tall fescue lawn. Is that grounded in, in real research or is that kind of a urban legend or one of those things that's just been perpetuated that there's not a whole lot of data behind? Well, it, it you know, the answer to all these things is that it depends, right? <laughs> um, so the, the, the biggest piece of that puzzle is to recognize that especially in our climate, there's actually two um, brown patch pathogens that we have to pay attention to. Um, we have a pretty deep understanding of one of those two, and we have a somewhat limited understanding of the second one. Um, the other piece that we have to acknowledge in that is that, that the lawn care professional or the sports turf manager or the golf course superintendent is not going to be able to tell which one of those two pathogens they have with any kind of guaranteed you know, identification ability because the symptoms that they produce on the turf are identical. And, and, uh, and so you know, that's, that's one of the pieces of this puzzle is that we have Rhizoctonia solani, which is what we typically think of as brown patch. And solani has a temperature optimum somewhere around 85, 86 degrees. Um, it, would, it would be the predominant pathogen that we would expect to see in this early part of the season, primarily because it's a little bit lower temperature optimum. Um, so we start to see brown patch start, start to show up when, you know, to Jim, to your point of, you know, low temperatures in the 70s. When we start getting into the upper 60s at night, mid to low 80s and during the day maybe a, you know 90 of a high but it's not it's not staying 90 for three or four hours but it's more like you know 85 86 for three or four or five hours on either side of it hitting 90 that's kind of the time when we're going to start to see typical what we think of as classic brown patch then the other pathogen which is rhizoctonia zia or rhizoctonia arise so I already messed you up because there's actually three pathogens, but Zia and Arise kind of cause the same disease that we, we think of as leaf and sheath blight, which is the common name. But if you're in practice looking at it in the field, you're going to see it and go, that's brown patch. Um, that, that disease, those two organisms tend to have a higher temperature optimum. So we tend to see those happen more often, whether you're talking about in tall fescue, in a home lawn, or uh, you know, any kind of overseeded perennial ryegrass in, a, in an athletic field situation, or on bent grass on a golf course uh, turf. The, the, we tend to see that leaf and sheath blight from these other two organisms happen usually when the lows are starting to be in the mid to upper 70s with highs in the, in the uh, low to mid 90s. So we're spending more of our time during the day in that upper 80s to low 90s window. That's when that, that and so there, there's some overlap. You know, if you were gonna draw that Venn diagram, there's a period where you could have both of these pathogens active at the same time and not really know which one was which from a practical consideration. There's ways for us to tell but it's not something, there's really only one way you're going to tell as a practitioner, and it's not a way that I would recommend doing it, and that's by spraying thiophanate methyl um, if, you're, if you're able to do that and, and it's labeled for whatever use you're using. If you were to spray that and it didn't control what you thought was brown patch, it's probably an indication that it's Zia. But all of our other fungicides are going to attack both of these with no trouble 
And so practically, we don't really worry about it too much. Just but you want to understand that there's the possibility of one of these three organisms causing a disease that looks like brown patch. Great. No, that's that's I mean, that's good info. And, and what I'm sure we'll get into the spray and, and treatment portion here in a minute. You know, another question that I I hear a lot through extension from from not only lawn care professionals that are maintaining tall fescue lawns, but some homeowners too, is, you know, we know that this is a disease of tall fescue in the summertime. Are there things that homeowners do to make it worse? Like it's going to naturally get it right. Just by the nature of the climate that we're in and it's, you know, somewhat omnipresent here can homeowners make it worse. So if I'm a lawn care professional and I'm, I'm maintaining this lawn, yeah, I'm going to come in and make a spray treatment and we'll talk about that. But what are the other messages that like, I can tell that homeowner, Hey, you don't want to do these things. Otherwise it's going to make your investment in this treatment. Uh, not as well spent as you want it to be. Yeah, I would say that there's, and, and David, feel free to chime in on this. You, you've seen some of this too, but there's, um, you know, there's, there's a, there's two things that I think of that are almost in opposition to each other when it comes to what is done in a typical home lawn situation to make brown patch worse. And you could argue there's really three things. We'll get to the third one in a second. But the first one is, you know, Dr. Farrakhan, what's the number one thing that a homeowner wants to, to see if they have their own irrigation system? The number one thing they want to see? Yeah. Green grass, usually. Yeah. And they want to see it run, right? Because they paid all yeah. that money. <laughs> so they don't want to see it, you know, in yeah. the ground and off. They want to see it, you know, with the cool heads popped up and and, and, and see it running. Yeah. And so we, we see that all, all the time is that, you know, if, if, you're, if you're maintaining the turf in a slightly over, it, you know, it doesn't have to be soggy, but if it's consistently moist, and you think you need it to be consistently moist to have green turf, one, that's not te technically correct. And two, you're just setting the table for these pathogens to get started because you're creating an environment of plenty of moisture, which is one of the number one things that that pathogen needs to get established and to get going. So if you can go through some periods where things dry, you know, even though moisture in the soil isn't going to be limiting for the, for the grass to grow, you know, and you would, you may, maybe look at it as a professional and think, you know, we're on the drier side of things to a homeowner. Often that, that, that's like, that's dry. It's going to start turning Brown. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, if you can get through to them that they need to have a period of time where the turf is a little bit dry, maybe even on the edge of a little bit of wilt before they they're watering, um, that's going to be helpful in reducing Brown patch. And then the, the other side of the coin that often happens in, home lawn situations is that we have on the fertility side, this idea that somehow kind of got put into the conventional wisdom that in the mid Atlantic and in the Southeast on cool season turf for lawn, we don't want to fertilize when it's warm, right? And we don't want to do that. And, and, and that's great that you just brought that up, Jim, because that's, that's an excellent example. Like the, we, that we don't want to fertilize and we, we got to keep, we got to keep the grass lean because this is a nitrogen, uh, this is a nitrogen loving disease. And if we fertilize, we're going to make it more conducive to, uh, to brown patch. Well, if you go back and I, I've got, I've got Dr. Beard's uh, turf grass science and culture here on my desk. Um, you go back and look at books like Dr. Beard's uh, Turf Grass Science and Culture, what you find out is that the, the studies that get cited where we think of pythium and brown patch as being high nitrogen diseases, that was back in an era where we were applying eight or 10 pounds per thousand square feet of nitrogen per, you know, per year. We don't do that anymore. We're, we're down at, you know, on a, on a really high end home lawn, we might be at four or five pounds for the entire season. Maybe, yeah. And, 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 and that would be relatively lush. So we're never getting to the amounts where it would make it more susceptible. But what we can do is we can be down at the other end of it where we're down at, at 
one or two pounds per thousand square feet, or maybe three pounds per thousand square feet. And we don't, if, if we don't have the right nitrogen sources delivering that over a consistent period of time, then we can get into periods where the plant is a little bit starved for nitrogen. It's not growing effectively. And as a result, it's going to be more susceptible to that pathogen getting started. And then it's not that the grass is more susceptible. What happens is the pathogen gets started during a period of conducive weather and you never recover out of it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But th this, this paper, you know, from, from Butler and Kearns and, and Glenn, um, they, they absolutely hit the nail on the head when it comes to uh, these issues. And you can see right there in their core ideas, you know, tall fescue lawns can be fertilized during the summer months at modest end rates without affecting brown patch severity. When an appropriate fungicide is used, the method of delivery doesn't affect brown patch suppression and rainfall within 15 minutes of the fungicide application didn't compromise fungicide efficacy. That's an important point too, because we get that question a lot. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about how that works with regards to some of the choices that we might make uh, on in terms of fungicide application. So Brandon, well, one of the things I see a lot of is, you know, homeowners want their tall fescue to look like Kentucky bluegrass. They want it to be fine textured and mowed really short. So they will, every fall, it's like they rent an airifier or have someone come in and airify their yard. And then they just overseed or re slit seed in at a really heavy rate. So you've got a lot, like a lot higher rates. So you got this fine texture and it looks great. September, October, November, and March, it looks great. But then come April, late April, early May, it just, it starts this, I think it's a self thinning grass. And that's where we see a lot of these issues as well. Yeah, for sure. The, the, the thing that was astounding to me when I moved from uh, the, the northern central Midwest to Virginia to the mid-Atlantic and then over here, the thing that astounds me is what we think of in this region, and, and it was the same in the mid-Atlantic, as overseeding is not what I was exposed to as overseeding when I was growing cool season stands in my home lawn and at, at our research facilities in, in the central and northern Midwest. Overseeding in that situation was this idea that, well, you know, we go through this stressful period in the summer, the turf gets thinned out a little bit. If we add a little bit of seed, we're expecting, we're fully expecting that the, the seed that we put down, very little of it's going to germinate. And the only places it's going to germinate are in the areas that are thinned out where the grass can get a foothold and start to grow and fill that area back in, right? When we come down here, when we see overseeding, like you mentioned, we see turf gets mown extremely short and in some cases scout down to the nub where it's not even gonna recover. It, the lawn gets aerified and cultivated in some way to expose the soil. And then essentially you reestablish, it's not overseeding, you've reestablished a turf war. And I would argue that in most cases, that's not necessary for the grasses that, that if, if the turf is in decent shape, yeah, maybe it's thinned out a little bit. You'd be far better off doing some sort of light scarification, opening that, that soil canopy up a little bit and then seeding at a, at a moderate rate, knowing that those areas that are thinner, you're gonna get a better take of seed and, and, and be good with it and, and, and not run the risk of of having to reestablish because then you're going into the next season with a highly susceptible grass. You've seeded at a higher rate. You have a denser canopy. It just makes everything more, you know, conducive to that, to that disease. Well, and as, as the weed scientist here, I'll chime in. I think a lot of that overseeding cycle is Bermuda grass management based that you get these, you get lawns that are 40 to 70 percent Bermuda grass and then you come in with non-selective herbicide to spray that Bermuda grass out and then you come in and re-establish this new tall fescue that is then susceptible to disease the following year and it's this never-ending kind of death spiral that kind of speaks to if there's that much Bermuda grass in your lawn maybe you should have a Bermuda grass lawn rather than a tall fescue lawn which is a topic for another day. I, 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 I could go down that road, but I won't because we have a couple of questions here that have come in while we've been chatting, Brandon. Um, one is a question about temperatures. And I know we talked about this in the beginning with Solani and Zia. Um, the gentleman who asked this question says that he typically watches for dew point to be 65 or above. 
should I be watching for nighttime temperatures or a combined nighttime day te nighttime and daytime temperature instead of dew point? I, I think if your experience is that 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 dew point, um, you know, the the, the dew point of, of 65 is when you start seeing activity. That's a pretty reasonable number. Um, you know, of course, the dew point is going to be a combination of both temperature and humidity because that's that's the point at where we would see condensation occurring out of the the moisture that's in the atmosphere onto a leaf surface or or what have you. So that's going to tell you that if the dew point 65, you're some combination of temperatures in the to the mid to upper 60s with plenty of humidity, uh, especially as you go into the night. So that's going to be a period of time where generally the day was probably fairly warm and 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 what have you. So um, that's certainly a fine, uh, fine kind of rule of thumb to use as a guide. Um, you can use nighttime temperatures. That's certainly an, an answer. One of the things that I think we should, you know, at some point today kind of hit on and, and point out is that that we also see a couple of other diseases in addition to brown patch that can be as problematic or more problematic in certain, certain situations because of what we're trying to do for brown patch management, right? Like we, we see, you know, plenty of pythium activity uh, in, in hot periods during the summer. And we're, we're also seeing more and an increased amount of gray leaf spot activity. So those are a couple of, uh, a couple of big, uh, you know, big things to think about too uh, in that regard. But if, if 65 is kind of dew point of 65 is kind of, you know, the number where you see, uh, you know, things pop up, that's, that's certainly a place to start. So uh, follow up to that. And we've got a couple people raise their hands while we've been chatting. If you have a question, please put your question in the Q&A box uh, and we'll get through as many of these as we can. So a follow up to that. Are there any micronutrients that help the tall fescue combat brown patch? I know that, you know, at the research center last year, it was kind of ironic that, you know, conventional wisdom is, we don't want to fertilize in the summer. And for the first year, we delivered slow release nitrogen to the entirety of the research plots. And you and David didn't really get any brown patch when we, we gave the turf nitrogen, right? No, David, did we get any brown patch? Uh, very, very minimal. And we even, you even inoculated some and, areas too. I, I not only inoculated, I like, I, I, you know, remember last year was COVID, right? So we were at home. I read an article where we could use the instant pot uh, to uh, function as an autoclave. I made my own brown patch inoculum in my kitchen with my instant pot at home, uh, much to my wife's chagrin because I was, you know, <laughs> boiling, you know, oat, oat, oat and wheat, uh, you know, kernels <laughs> uh, in in the instant pot to sterilize them to make our uh, brown patch inoculum, and then we were taking leaf tissue. Uh, and and uh, pulling leaf tissue from infected tall fescue plants and other places and putting them into the canopy by, I was putting them into the canopy by hand, trying to get any kind of disease activity to go. And it was, we, we got a little bit, but not very much. And that was largely, uh, I think, because the turf was reasonably well fertilized. And so, uh, Dr. Sorokin, you want to make a comment about uh, your, your uh, views on micronutrients in terms of turf growth? I think, uh, yeah, you know, definitely they're rarely or ever do we see them limiting in, in tissue tests or soil tests. Um, the, the, again, the, the, the driving element is nitrogen. Um, and, you know, I don't think as a homeowner, I don't think you need to be putting a lot of these micronutrients out because um, they're never limiting, especially in a native soil, they're going to be abundant and, uh, you know, Moderate rates of nitrogen. Yeah, it's great to put out just straight urea, 4600, but you get that surge of growth. If you can get a slow release, um, I believe they sell they, 3400, but it's not ammonium nitrate. It's basically a, a reduced fertilizer of urea. Um, but if you can get anything that's got a slow release, I think that's going to just provide a steady growth. So you don't want those peaks and valleys of surges of growth, I think, because that just makes it more lush and more vulnerable, I believe, wouldn't it, Brandon? Yeah, absolutely, and and I think that's an excellent point. Is that the the um, that the that, that a slow release form of nitrogen is really important. And we just had a question 
come in, what kind of slow release uh, nitrogen uh, are we talking about? And what I would tell you is that um, you, you want to look at, at a couple of different sources, right? Like if you have uh, in, in, the, in the fall and in the spring, that's where I would use more of my very slow release, somewhat water insoluble nitrogen sources, uh, organic based uh, fertilizers, things like that to provide kind of a base level of fertility. And then throughout the course of the season, I would be more relying on, upon things like the polymer coated ureas where we have a, a coat of polymer on the outside of the prill that allows that, that prill to slowly release its, its uh, soluble nitrogen over the course of some period of time. And depending on uh, the level of intensity of management and the budget and things, you can get things that will release over very long periods of time, or you get a, a, you know, a coated urea that might release over a four to six week period. Either of those is going to work. It's going to it's going to change the rate that you put the fertility down at, but it's an, it, in terms of the amount of fertility that you're putting down per thousand square feet, uh, and as a as a rate of nitrogen, you're you're just going to change how much fertilizer you put down to get that given rate for that period of time. Um, so um, that's important. And then we have another question about. Uh, what rate of nitrogen per thousand square feet uh, is acceptable during the brown patch season? What what I would say is is that some of the research that I've done and and then Jim had that that paper up that is is an applied turfgrass science paper which is designed to be written for practice you know practitioners in the field. So I'd encourage you to go find that paper uh, if you'd like and and it's on the recording. So if you're not sure, you can always go back to the recording uh, and and have a look at that paper and find it online. But uh, the research that I've done suggests that that in in our area in Knoxville in the in the transition zone somewhere in the neighborhood of of three to five pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year is kind of the the, the number that we want to be targeting. If you're if you're uh, able to and you have a budget that supports that higher fertility rate, uh, you have in ground irrigation, you have regular uh, mowing that's being done at an optimal height, like three and a half to four inches, not one and a half to two inches, then you're going to find uh, that, that, that you're going to have a very nice high performing lawn that looks good. Uh, and you're going, you might have some disease, you might still need to make a fungicide application if, if your desire is to not have disease activity. But you're also going to find, and we'll point this out in just a minute, that, that those ebbs and flows, because this is, it's important to remember that you know, we don't enter June and then we're in brown patch season until August. We go through, you know, cycles of disease activity. And so what you're going to find is that if you have enough fertility in the plant so that it can grow uh, readily during the summer and you're irrigating it often enough so that it's able to, you know, soil moisture is not the limiting factor in its ability to grow, then what you're going to find is that when you have those periods where disease isn't as conducive, the turf is going to recover and you're going to see those symptoms go away. What we tend to see and what has, has kind of been one of my issues with the conventional wisdom of not fertilizing all during the summer because it's gonna make turf more lush is that we end up in a, in, a, in, a, in a place where the plant is nitrogen starved. It's not as able to grow. We tend to overwater in that situation thinking that well, if we just put more water down, it'll grow better. And so we set up this recipe for disease activity on a plant that's not recovering and recuperating. So we get some disease activity, we see a patch, we get a period where it doesn't really spread or move or, or develop. So it just kind of sits there because the plant's not really readily growing. Then we get another period of disease activity and it gets bigger. And then we go through another period where it's not really happening. So it just kind of sits there. And then we get another period of disease activity and it gets bigger. And so what you see over the course of the entire season is a, is a, a patch that starts out at some size and it just kind of gradually gets bigger. What you see in a well-fertilized lawn is you see a patch, even if you don't spray, it might get a little bit bigger because of the disease period that it's happening. And then you get a period where the grass is able to grow and recover. And so the patch and the symptoms kind of slowly go away. Then you see a patch form and gets maybe a little bit bigger. And then so you see it ebb and flow even without fungicide application. And if you add a fungicide application in during those periods, well, then you're just not going to see the disease develop. But 
by managing the turf, and I think Jim, you can speak to this is from the herbicide uh, perspective as well, that if we manage the turf in an optimal way, that is going to be our best defense against either diseases or weed encroachment. Wouldn't you agree? No, for sure. And, and if I'm kind of understanding what we've talked about today correctly, it, it, you know, if we're using in a lawn care context, slow release nitrogen fertilizer, you know, that might be a scenario where maybe round two, where we're going to come into a lawn and maybe put out a pre-emergence crabgrass herbicide. If that has some slow release nitrogen to go with it, that's going to gradually feed throughout the summer. And then as we kind of maybe get into the end of the year, whether that's round four um, or maybe even a tick later based on how your business is structured, then we get into a fall timing where the environment is now more favorable for that tall fescue. We give it another dose of slow release nitrogen and it's going to take us into the, the close of the season. Is that a pretty good understanding? Yeah, I would, I would, I would say that, that, that fits very, very nicely. And, and right. then so, it depends on your, you know, your choice of, of fertility source. And it depends on your, the way your business is structured in terms of how many rounds are you hitting over the course of the season as to when you put that fertility out. Right. And, and you know, so for the lawn care operators that are listening, you know, I think one of the key takeaways is you're not putting fertilizer out every time you're on that property, right? That it's not an every round thing. It's better to be strategic with slow release delivery so the turf always has what it's need, what it needs rather than quick hits on a four to six week interval when you're there. Right, and, and you, you can certainly find those sources that are somewhat slow release that are on that, you know, probably not four week, but, a, but certainly a six week interval that would give you that, that cycle time. Or you could find one that's like a, say an eight week, you know, release, you know, profile where you, you go out every other month with an, a fertility source and, and, and just know that you're going to be feeding over those two months and, and maybe the round in between you're hitting, you know, a weed issue or, or an insect issue or whatever. So that it's not like you can't have a cycle in between. You just are putting something else down. Right. And, you know, and you talked earlier about periods of outbreak and then recovery. And I think we see that on this screen. So this is a brown patch risk model. Um, this was not developed on tall fescue. Uh, this was developed on perennial ryegrass. And to simplify things, I've gone in here and put down this line uh, right at that number of five, which is my understanding is where uh, you're likely to see symptoms on turf. And, you know, if you count kind of the tick marks above the five line here, there's, you know, probably eight to 10 uh, from the period of June 1st till October 1st. Um, and then we get periods of recovery and, and that's where that nitrogen is going to help, right? Brandon is in that recovery period where it falls below that line. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, uh, this is the output of the, the Fidanza brown patch model. Um, there's a couple of them. There's one that's called an E6 model and one that's an E2 model. They both use some combination of temperature and relative humidity. So to the dew point question, that's, you know, this is using some sort of similar kind of uh, model to do that. It basically predicts uh, a threshold of risk or no risk. It was developed on perennial ryegrass. So as I like to call it, uh, the white mouse of the turf world, because it's susceptible to just about everything. Um, I've never heard that before. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's it. Perennial ryegrass, the white mouse of the turf world. Um, it's susceptible to all the diseases. Um, and, and so uh, certainly that, that's one of those species that's very conducive to brown patch development. Uh, but tall fescue is going to behave relatively similar. So this works as a good proxy. Um, and generally speaking, when those numbers are between like four and six, um, the, the, you know, the paper that this was developed and published on says when you hit six, that's when you would expect a, a warning for brown patch symptom development. But generally four to six is kind of where we start to consider ourselves at more risk. And like you were saying, you can see that over the course of, of the summer in Nashville last year, we had you know, a number of those periods where we got up and over that kind of threshold. And what we wanna pay attention to is 
not the ones that like in at the end of May where you barely tick over the top and then it dips way down in, in early June and then comes back up for a, a quick tick and then dips way down. You might see a little bit of development and 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 then very quickly, especially in a in a reasonably well fertilized lawn, it's going to go away. But the ones that we want to pay attention to are these ones where we see a tick up and then it kind of hovers in that area or it goes up and stays up like at the end of August there. That's a good example where we would expect to see like, wow, this is really going gangbusters. Um, and and like like I was saying, the, the, the thing is that we see these increases in, in disease uh, conduciveness and that's where we're going to see some symptom development if we don't apply a fungicide and then if we have the turf that's reasonably well fertilized, we're going to see recovery when that when that period kind of dips back down below our risk threshold. We're going to see some recovery, and that's what we want to see in a high performance lawn. We don't want to see a patch start, and then we have to rely solely on a fungicide application to try to keep symptoms at bay. I can guarantee you, having done lots and lots of fungicide trials, and David can speak to this, being the, the person on the ground doing this, that that the easiest way for us to get large amounts of disease where we want to rely on fungicides to control it is to treat the turf in a poor condition that's, you know, it's doing okay, but it's not great because then that makes the turf more susceptible to whatever it is we want to do. I mean, David, would you say that's what we do? That's exactly what we do. Right. Like we often refer to it as benign <laughs> neglect. We're not trying to kill the grass. We're trying to keep it alive just good enough that it's really susceptible to disease. And then we can we can get after the disease development piece. And so, so that's, I mean, that's what we do all the time. And, and, and then by nature of what our job is, which is to look at some of these uh, fungicide products to try to control the disease, we're relying on just the fungicide to control the disease. And sometimes even a high performing product in the field at the practitioner level might not perform quite as well in our trials because we're tipping the balance over towards the pathogen as much as we can. And, and, and it just demonstrates how important managing the stand is to make that fungicide perform the way it, need, it could and can perform. So with you, with you guys doing so much testing of different fungicides and their efficacy on brown patch and other diseases, uh, but to stay on task with brown patch here, you know, for the lawn care operators that are listening, so is it better for them to come into a lawn and make an application at a time where we know we're getting into a weather period where this could be an issue, but there's no symptoms? Are they better to come in and make the app then, or is it better to wait for maybe the homeowner to call them and say, hey, I've got these spots in my yard. I need you to come and take a look and then make, a, you know, essentially a curative treatment. Is there a, a better course of action there? So there, there, you kind of have two options. And, and I've, I've heard the answer to this question both ways in terms of the practitioner, the lawn care operator. Um, so if your business is set up that, that, having that interaction with the customer is advantageous that they call you and say, Hey, I need you to come do this. And then they see the results of what you do and they're satisfied and they go, Oh yeah, you took care of it. That's great. Thank you. Then, then certainly that curative approach can work. Um, from a general management perspective, I would argue that preventative management is usually better and more successful. It often allows you to use less of the product, you can use a little bit lower rate. You don't necessarily have to go at the very high rate. Um, and, and so that, that can be advantageous too from a economics perspective. Um, so it really depends on your business as to which strategy you might wanna follow. Uh, but generally speaking, I would, I would tend to lean more towards a preventative model. And then um, do that paper that you had up before and then um, some of the work that, that I and some others have done, you know, pretty clearly shows that a little bit of irrigation isn't going to mess up or rainfall isn't going to mess up your fungicide application. That's largely based on using a systemic material, particularly like the QOIs, like Heritage or Insignia uh, or Fame. Those, those, uh, those QOIs that we might choose to, to go after brown patch on a home lawn, they're going to be uh, just fine 
uh, if they get lightly watered in because they're systemic enough to get up into the upper canopy of the turf and, and actually give you some disease control, even if they were watered in a little bit. So if you have a little bit of, you know, you know, rainfall or the homeowner turns the irrigation system on after you're done at their property, uh, that's going to be okay. Um, and you can't really water too much unless you're getting runoff, actual runoff. Uh, you, you can't water too much to move it too far through the profile, especially in a native soil. So that's not really going to cause you any, any issue. And then these QOIs, the, one of the reasons why they give us that 28 to 35 day window of control at that moderate rate is that they actually get cycled through the plant multiple times. So those, those molecules of the fungicide will be applied to the leaf surface, they'll get into the leaf, they'll be translocated systemically, they'll get exuded out of the plant with dew and mutation water irrigation event or a rainfall washes them back down. They get reabsorbed into the plant and translocated again. They don't break down super rapidly. So they'll get, they'll get moved through that plant two or three times in the course of a 28 or 35 day cycle at a high enough concentration to give you disease control. So that's, that's one of the reasons why they're so advantageous for, for a lawn care operation is that you get that, that monthly cycle that kind of lines up with your, with your, um, your cycle times uh, and, and return visits. Well, Jim, can you put that chart back up really quick? I, Cause I just have a, a question. Cause this is where both of you guys as weed scientists and pathologists want to make my life miserable, but you also help me in controlling things, but how symbiotic you guys are with, if you look at the chart in the, in the late May, early June, it's starting to get into some brown patch pressure. And so that's where the, the canopy starting to thin in some of these tall fescues and then weeds being opportunistic. Um, that's about when you probably need to put your second application for pre-emergent in the transition zone for crabgrass. And we always see, seem to see have a late outbreak of crabgrass if you don't put that second app out. Is there a problem with combining that preventative fungicide with a pre-emergent for these lawn care operators um, at that I, I time? Wouldn't, I wouldn't think so other than it's two applications. So there'd be a a you know the crab you're not going to find a, a um, if you're using a granular as your pre-emergence crabgrass uh, material for example you're not going to find a fungicide preloaded on that granule with a herbicide um, you know with mixing a herbicide and a fungicide in the same spray that gives me a little bit of heartburn I'm one who kind of likes to have one thing in the tank to do what it's intended to do I don't know how you feel about that Brandon yeah I, I... I, I would hedge against that. Um, but I would also say that, you know, if you're, if you're doing a jar test or whatever, I think it would depend very much on, on the, particularly on the chemistry of the, of the pre-emerge in terms of whether it's going to be compatible or not. You would want to make sure that it's compatible before you start mixing up tanks of it. Um, right. But certainly like, but it's a good time to go at one time. If you're visiting the home site, put out a granular at that in that June yeah. application and then your, your fully or maybe a fully or, or liquid uh, fungicide app, but a granular pre-emergent again. So you yeah, can or, or be there one time around. and not have to come back. Yeah, or the other way around. There's, right. there's plenty of granular fungicides that, that perform equally to our spray applications, uh, especially in home lawn situations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you could go either way. You could, you could be applying it in, in you know, a, a pre-emerge in a liquid or uh, in a granular uh, on a carrier and then making the other, you know, a liquid application of one or the other as well. Yeah. So that, that's an important point, Brand. There are granular options for these fungicides that are, because we think about fungicides typically as all sprays, right? But yes. for, the, for, for brown patch and tall fescue lawns, there are granular delivery options. There's a, there's a number of them uh, and a number of really good performing. Uh, we've done a lot of work with that. David can speak to that. Um, there's, there's a number of granular fungicides that have performed really well. I would say that the key to, if you're going to go down that road, the key to selecting uh, a granular fungicide is to make sure that it's on one of the high performance carriers. Um, there's plenty of fungicides that are granular, uh, but there's a smaller subset of those that are on what we would consider to be the more high performance carriers like like a DG Pro or uh, some of the other uh, higher performance 
carriers where you get a little bit of moisture and they, they actually kind of explode into smaller micro particles and that gives you the coverage that you need into the, into the canopy. Um, some of the older granular fungicides, part of the reason why they got a bad name was that you had large particle sizes being applied to the, to the turf. Uh, they, would, they would release their fungicide in a fairly limited area and so you wouldn't have full coverage and as a result of not having full coverage, you would still see disease develop. Um, and, and so these newer uh, particle size and particle technologies have allowed us to have some fungicides that work very effectively uh, via a granular application. Do if they have talk, nutrients with them too? Not usually. They're usually just by themselves. Single carrier. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you talked, Brandon, about irrigation with sprayable fungicides and, and rainfall with sprayable fungicide not affecting efficacy. I would imagine if you're if you're a lawn care operator using a granular fungicide, irrigation's as critical as as irrigating in a, a, a barricade on on a granular Absolutely. carrier. Absolutely. Yeah, the, it's it. In fact, to get these these technologies to work, they require some irrigation. So you do need to to apply a, a bit of irrigation after the application to really get those granular uh, fertilizer or granular fungicides to work. Um, David, typically, what would you say is the the recommendations and most of the protocols we've had for for irrigation after a granular app? About how much or yeah. Um, I'd say around a quarter of an inch. Yeah. Some, some, sometimes they want, um, I'm sorry, an eighth of an inch. Sometimes they want a quarter of an inch and that gets, that's a fair amount of water. That's a fair, yeah. by the time you walk, you irrigate a quarter of an inch, you're not getting on that area for a while. Cause it's too wet. Right. So. Yeah. You, usually I would say anywhere between a, a 10th and an eighth of an inch. So 0.1 to 0.125 inches. Um, and then, and then it also depends on your irrigation system, uh, in a home lawn situation, you might need to go up to like 0.2, just because the nozzle size is such that you can't, you, you need enough of a runtime to actually get the thing to turn in the full circle, um, to get enough water out. Um, but, but for the most part, you, if, if you give it a, uh, you know, a full, uh, at least a tenth of an inch and, and somewhere between a tenth and two tenths of an inch is going to be pretty ideal. If you get up more than that, to, to your point, David, you're going to get kind of soupy and muddy, uh, especially if you have to run it for a long time. Well, and I think it's so interesting too. You know, we think about these fungicide applications for brown patch, you know, you're going to come into a tall fescue lawn, maybe make these preventatively. And I think you said earlier, Brandon, you know, 28 days maybe of activity and you know in the weeds world we talk about pre-applications and we're, we're it's it's months of activity right you know i i can make a maximum label rate of of prodiamine in, in march and it's gonna take me deep into august if not later um so i think that's an important message for the lawn care operators that are listening that you know the 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 pre kind of model is going to be different in the fungicide world than it is in the in the weed science world that it's a much much shorter length of time that you're protected yeah absolutely and that's largely due to the fact that that and it goes back to this concept of ebb and flow or the flux of the grass right is that the grass is growing so you make an application of the fungicide it's in that that turf plant for some period of time, that plant is growing, you are mowing off leaf material at some frequency that's now been removed with some portion of that fungicide product. Whereas like in a pre-emerge situation, you're putting that into the soil, creating a barrier in the soil. It's not being moved or translocated around inside of the desired plant right? If you're putting a right. systemic herbicide down, yeah, it's being translocated around the plant that you're trying to kill, but it's not being translocated through the turf plant and, and causing the lack of control. So the, with the fungicide, you're trying to get it inside the plant and it's being translocated around. You're mowing off a portion of that every so often that has some concentration of it. So the concentration over time goes down and that interval that we talk about is largely related to well how long is the is is the fungicide 
not broken down metabolically, how long does it take for a portion of it to get mowed off so that the concentration is lowered to the point where it's no longer effectively controlling the growth of the fungus? And then there's a period of time where we would expect the disease to be able to develop and cause disease. So when you couple all that together, some of our really strong systemically translocated fungicides, we're going to see intervals that are you know, possible somewhere between 21 and 35 days. Um, and then with some of our, our not as translocated materials or contact materials, you're going to see intervals that are much shorter, like seven or 10 or 14 days. Um, and then it becomes kind of rate dependent on what you want to do. Right. And then, you know, in the herbicide world, you think about you make a, a pre-emergence application, you're dealing with something that binds to organic matter pretty tightly. So it sticks to, you know, sticks around in the soil and it's fairly water insoluble. So that kind of burn rate, if you will, of the active in the soil is just much, 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 much slower. And as you mentioned, you're not going to be affected by mowing uh, or anything along those lines because it's acting on weed seedlings that are below ground that you can't see yet. Um, so it's just an interesting dynamic. We had a question come in while we were chatting, uh, and I know this is kind of right in your wheelhouse, you and David. Are there any research or thoughts on generic azoxy products compared to branded? Are there any new fungicides coming that we really need to keep an eye out on, keep an eye on for the future? Um, can you guys speak to that at all? Yeah, uh, the, the, the two things that I would, I would say is with regards to generic azoxy versus a branded azoxy like Heritage uh, is, is going to be, uh, there's, there's two thoughts I have there. The first one is that um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big proponent of, of supporting organizations and companies that support the industry and continue to do research in the industry, trying to support and improve products and their availability for the various uses in, in the turf world. Um, so if you're talking about a completely generic product uh, where none of that work is being done and they're just basically, you know, manufacturing it and selling it for the cheapest price possible, that might be great to you as an operator. Um, that might be advantageous to you. I would say two things that I've seen just in terms of differences from product to product is that the things that I see that are most frequently an issue when it goes from branded down to various levels of generic or, or uh, you know, off-brand type of uh, materials is that the formulation and the manufacturing, um, you know, the, the manufacturing practices are what change. So uh, with those branded products, the manufacturers are making sure that the particle size and the mill size of the molecule is, is optimal for being suspended in that liquid formulation their suspension concentrates and their formulation technology. They're constantly trying to improve and tweak so that the fungicide is getting to where it needs to go in as efficient a manner as possible so that it can be taken up. Uh, and, and then uh, anything that is potentially going to be tank mixed, that those, that those formulation uh, materials are such that they're not going to interact with other formulation materials and cause an incompatibility problem, things like that. Those are the things that I see that are big differences from, from branded to, to, to unbranded products is, is that it's in that area of ease of use, ease of application, uh, lack of exposure. One of the things that I've seen uh, in, in terms of some of the work that I've done just with various products, uh, both branded and not branded, that are still even in that area of, of you know, products that, are, that you know, a company still doing some research on is like you'll see uh, one product might not produce very much dust at all, and you might see another product that has more dust. Like when you when you weigh something out, you see some dust particles come up, indicating that the particle size distribution in that formulation is such that there's maybe some smaller par particles that can get up in the air. That becomes an exposure risk for your for your workers. Um, you know that you know maybe they. That, you know, they need to be, they, they need to be a little more careful if you're using one of those products that has more dust flying up in the air. I, that's, that's certainly something you want to think about as a business owner is you don't want to be exposing yourself to liability as a result of exposure to, to an application uh, for, for your, uh, for your workers. So 
those are the, the big differences I see on the branded, unbranded. And then what was the second part of the question? It was new, new, product. new, product. new product. Yeah. Um, let me, I just pull up and, and share my screen here. Um, and we can kind of zip through a few um, materials. Because I know in one of our sessions last year, you guys shared there's there's several new things that are out there. I don't know if they're specific to Brown Patch or not. Yeah, there's there's a number. So we'll just I'll I've got some new products in this in this little slide deck here, and we can run through a couple of them uh, quickly. Union is the product that's been out for about a year and a half or so now uh, from PBI Gordon. Uh, it has a combination of azoxystrobin and cyazofamid which is a, a Pythium product. And this could be a really, uh, really good broad spectrum material to apply on a tall fescue lawn in the middle of the summer. This could be excellent for, for a situation like that. Um, you know, uh, Pedigree is another, uh, it's a flutolanil, excellent on brown patch. Uh, Posterity is another SDHI that's been, been uh, you know, pretty good on a, on a broad spectrum of materials. Uh, or broad, broad spectrum of diseases. We've got a couple of other family members, Posterity XT, which is going to give you propiconazole plus the SDHI plus azoxystrobin. So you're going to get a very broad spectrum of disease control from that. Uh, Posterity Forte has a little bit of lower propiconazole load, so it could be better in a, in a hotter temperature condition. Generally, we're not going to worry about that in, in, in uh, uh, lawn care situations. Um, uh, Acernity is another material, and I, I haven't dug into the labels on these to know for sure if there's restrictions on lawn care. So, you know, put my plug in for the label is the law since we're doling out uh, credits here that, that you make sure that you read the label and you follow any restrictions on some of these materials if they limit uh, your ability in certain situations, like you can't apply it to a home lawn, but maybe you can apply it to a business campus things like that. Those are things to pay attention to on the label. So uh, keep those things in mind. Um, I will say that this salatinol uh, benzovin uh from uh, Syngenta, that has been an absolute world beater in terms of rhizoctonia management, both large patch and brown patch. Uh, we've seen it perform extremely well in our trials. So that's, that's uh, been a new product that's come out. Uh, and then we've got the, you know, Heritage Action, which is another uh, material that, that might be useful in a, in a large or a, a brown patch situation. So there's, there's a number of products there that, that are, are relatively new uh, that, that have really good brown patch control. We've seen a, a, a pretty large expansion of the SDHI class, which typically has had uh, very good brown patch control across the portfolio of, of materials in that class. The QOIs, we'll see, and we see combos of those. Uh, one of the questions we get a lot is about uh, fungicide resistance. Typically, when it comes to brown patch management, we don't need to worry about that so much. Um, brown patch has a life cycle that it's not super conducive to the development of resistance. So uh, you can get away with not rotating your fungicides as much. But if you're in a situation where you have like a mixed stand of Kentucky bluegrass and tall fescue, and you're worried about dollar spot, then you're definitely going to want to make sure that you're you're rotating uh, some of those uh, chemicals around so that you're 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 in a rotational system on the dollar spot side of things. Uh, but with with brown patch, typically we don't need to worry about fungicide resistance is is nearly as much. It's a lot lower risk fungus for the development of that. And Brandon, as I I'm going to bring up uh, for our listeners that are interested in GCSAA credits, I'm going to bring this up. We had one other question come in before we sign off. Um, for those interested in GCSAA certification credits, this is your, your event approval code right here. I'll leave this on the screen. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, you want to make sure that you note the original event date uh, when you submit to GCSAA, not the date that you watched it on YouTube, but this original event date. Uh, our last question uh, before we sign off here um, it was actually about Dollar Spot and Dollar Spot on Tall Fescue this year. Um, has this been a particularly good year for Dollar Spot so far in the spring in, in East Tennessee? Well, typically we don't see Dollar Spot on 
tall fescue. It's not something that we, we typically see uh, occurring on tall fescue. So what I tend to think in that regard is that there tends to be, especially if it's a, a, a sod installation, um, you might have had a, a fairly decent amount of Kentucky bluegrass in that sward. Um, Kentucky bluegrass is pretty susceptible to dollar spot and uh, the weather that we've had this spring with being a moderate, mild, somewhat moist uh, spring would certainly be conducive to dollar spot development in, in a Kentucky bluegrass stand. I've seen dollar spot development on some of our warm season grasses at a, at a more broad, uh, more broadly this spring than we typically see. We might see a real short period where we see dollar spot on the warm season grasses and then it goes away because grass gets growing so fast that it just kind of disappears. Uh, and the weather gets warm. Uh, but with this spring that we've had, it's been relatively cool. Dollar spot's certainly been favored in those situations. So that's one possibility. And then um, the other possibility uh, would be kind of going back to last fall uh, and, and, and late summer, uh, we're starting to see more gray leaf spot on, on tall fescue. Certainly over in the Carolinas, they got decimated last uh, late summer, early fall with gray leaf spot. Um, so that's something that we can kind of expect during that period of the year, but that wouldn't explain activity this spring uh, for, for that disease. But those are, those are two that you want to pay attention to. And, and certainly if, you're, if, if we're hot and humid and, and the grass is growing and you got a high canopy, uh, you want to pay attention to the development of Pythium as well uh, being a possibility. So those are, those are some other diseases that we want to pay attention to. Uh, but my suspicion with regards to dollar spot is that that's probably uh, on a mixed sward of Kentucky bluegrass and tall fescue. And you're just seeing it now uh, because dollar spot's been so prevalent. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk about disease in September again. And I'm, I, I, I'd be willing to bet that you and David, I know we're going to have some other pathologists join us for that session as well. Jim Kearns and, and Joe Roberts, you'll have all sorts of fun observations for what was uh problematic in the in the summer that will be coming um so let's let's leave, let's leave it there um thanks for all for joining us again today for another one of these sessions these are super fun for us and we hope that you uh and get something out of it uh enjoy what we're talking about and they your credits and all that um our next session in july will be a week later we moved it off so we weren't right on the uh july 4th holiday so uh, come see us again in July. I believe we're on July 13th. Um, and until then, have a great rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.